Well, why don't we kick this off, Melanie? Sounds good. We are one minute after the hour. I'm in Northern California. Um, where are you, Melanie? I'm in Hot Springs, Arkansas. All right. So we're going to kick off a, a poll question here for everyone. So if you could answer that, we'd love it to um, kind of get you engaged and um, learn some more about who is here today. We have attendees from all over the country. This is the first time we've done this and we're live today. This is not recorded. Um, during this webinar, feel free to drop a question in anytime um, through the Zoom, the Zoom link on your um, Zoom screen. We probably won't address it on the spot, but we'll try to get them to them at the end of the webinar. Um, and we have 45 minutes planned today. So we're gonna try to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. So just use that, that question link and we will, we will get to that. So a little bit about Melanie and I, I'm going to um, really have Melanie start. She's from National Park College. She's one of our Squiz clients. She's the Director of Marketing and Public Relations there. So Melanie, tell us a little bit about what you're doing over there at National Park College. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about um, our, our project that we've just started, our, our website redesign. Um, I've been at National Park for almost 18 years. And our website has gone through a lot of changes in that time, but we are we are just beginning on the the start of a major overhaul, and so we're very excited about that. And we implemented the Squiz Funnel Back Search in 2017, um, and so it's been a few years ago. And so we've got a lot of data behind us, and uh, we're excited to put that to use in our project. Excellent! I am excited to talk to you today. A uh, little bit about me. Um, I've worked at two large public institutions. First, I was the webmaster at Northern Arizona University. Um, this was a position in the marketing department. And so I had to quickly learn how to work with the central IT division. And the last 13 years, I spent at California State University, Sacramento as the director of web and mobile services, um, where I worked in the central IT um, division, managing a team of eight developers. Um, we had the CMS, the LMS, the search, uh, the portal, and legacy applications all over campus. Um, and, and then right at the beginning of the pandemic, I created EdTech Connect, um, which is how I learned about Squiz. Um, it's really a technology search engine for higher ed. And when I realized what Squiz was doing, I left my pension job in, Sac in Sacramento at the university. And I was just wanted to be on this side of it, helping schools um, kind of implement uh, solutions for the future. And I've been there 10 months now um, as a business development representative. Um, so some of my experience, I've really talked from the point of being that web director because I did that for 20 plus years. And one of the things I did late in my career there and starting in 2019 was something that we called the Web Stewardship Project. And we took our 12,000 page site and we, we, it was called the Burn and Build until it got rebranded to the Web Stewardship Project. But we, we created a new site and with no copy paste, and it was a, a complete rebuild. So it was pretty transformational back in 2019. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the successes and failures. And one of them was search, which, which is what we're talking about today and what I wish we would have done different. Um, so that's a little bit about me. But what I think we need to really start with is talking about the complexity of higher ed and how that makes search so critical. And it's something that I think we often don't take control over. So I kind of want to kick it to you, Melody, if you look at these stats here. Um, what's your experience with content sprawl with, with the situation that a lot of schools are in right now? Ouch. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say, you know, National Park College is a, we're a comprehensive community college campus. And so we serve about 7,000 students a year uh, across all different types of credit and non-credit programs. And so our mission is so broad and that really makes our content broad. And so because we serve so many different types of constituencies, um, it results in a site that is just monstrous, to be honest. And we really depend on search to help filter that content so that our site visitors have a well-functioning experience. Yeah, I think you're not alone. I think that resonates with so many schools. Um, Steve Jobs has a bunch of 
great quotes. Um, another one, in addition to the, you know, innovation is the only way to win. Um, another one I like is, uh, he, he's a little, I guess you could say arrogant at, at the time, but um, customers don't know what they want until we've shown them. And so often in the context of search, I think um, we really need to put ourselves in our students' shoes. If a prospective student's looking for a program or a major, and we expect them to find that through a program link or a course catalog somewhere through navigational paths, you know, I think that's um, a challenge um, to say the least. So I just want to put that in there. So here's our here's our agenda today. Um, we're going to put out a poll real quick too to um, to really ask you what what search you're using. Um, so please answer that. It'll really help us kind of learn more about about you. But here's a list of five advantages of optimizing search before or during your web overhaul. So we say before in the title of this webinar, but I kind of want to go into why you know it's it's okay to do during the project too. But part of what's driving this agenda today is just having this conversation. I'm seeing so many schools go through web projects and, and not address search. Um, I think it's often just because, oh, it's just another thing to do. We'll do that after. It's just, we're doing so much. Um, but if you look at CMS as being 10 plus years old, 10, 15 years old, um, there's often a replatforming involved. And when we did our big project in 2019, when we went from 12,000 pages to 1,500 pages overnight, um, we didn't scope that in and I wish we did. Um, so Melanie, tell me about how you're handling search, a little bit more about search at um, National Park College. Well, I, I think, um, you know, even though at National Park, we have a centralized governance model for our website, we still experience issues. I mean, um, you know, we're planning to use the data that we gather from uh, funnel back search to help us guide decisions about the redesign and, and you know, just start the project off right from the beginning. Um, I, I think that's, you know, important to take that data and to use it to make smart decisions. And, um, and you know, just because we have a centralized governance model and we control all the content that goes there doesn't mean that, you know, trash doesn't end up there. We It's still a lot of content to sort through. And so uh, we have a small team doing that. and. Um, every tool that we can utilize to make that more efficient is a benefit. You touched on something that I talk about all the time, which is web governance. And that could be a whole nother uh, webinar in itself, um, but it really comes down to that um, at, at every corner, I feel like. So let's dive right into it, into the list here. Um, so access to powerful analytics. And when we talk about powerful analytics, I think it kind of goes back to that Steve Jobs quote. And, I, and often sometimes, you know, my belief is web admins and staff just might not know what to ask for. So it's it's pretty easy to report on top keywords. I used to do that every month. I'd report top keywords to my administrators and we wouldn't do a whole lot with it, um, you know, with any search um, on like a monthly basis. But you really need to know things like what's being clicked on when people type in those top search results for any given keyword or where are users coming from or what search terms are not producing any results. And the other thing about analytics, I think, is if you're going through a web overhaul, and tell me if this is true, Melanie, um, I think a benchmark really needs to be established because you're really trying to kind of prove that what you did makes sense, right? To establish like before and after, um, how has your user's behavior changed? So I guess I would ask you, Melanie, are you planning to use Funnelback in this project you're working on um, with these search analytics? Yeah, absolutely. I think setting a benchmark is really great advice. You know, we're just getting started on our project, but we definitely need to decide what are those things that we want to benchmark now and measure now, and then determine, you know, what do we want to look at a year from now? What are we going to need to be measuring then? And um, how can we set that up for success today? Um, but I'll also mention that, um, you know, the the uh, curator and the best bets and the synonyms are things that you can use, not just for a redesign, but, you know, all the time. I mean, um, I'll note that when we went through, um, you know, the heat of the pandemic, um, we had so much uh, COVID-19 information on our site and we use the curator and the synonyms and the best bets to help guide users who, because COVID-19, you know, there were lots of different terms being thrown around. 
Some people use COVID-19, some people use coronavirus, some people use just COVID. And so if someone's searching for those terms and they're not finding the right content, that's frustrating. And it was, um, you know, a crisis situation at that time. So, uh -huh. you know, we, we used it in, in that respect as well. Wow. Um, that's great information. Um, yeah, I'd love to show Curator, but let me know. We're not showing it today. It's such a great part of this product, but um, I'm glad to hear you use, use so many of those tools. The other one that I know you have a lot of experience with, um, and one of the biggest drivers for, I think, many digital transformations, especially, especially in my experience, um, is accessibility. Uh, I went through an OCR complaint um, and had to defend that. And a search tool is really a great way to do this because if you think about it, it's already indexing all your content or it should be. So we survived that complaint because it was after our project and our content was all gone, which is a really interesting situation to be in. Um, but you know, that reduced our content by 80%, but you've taken it, you've used a tool to kind of reduce your, your um, accessibility um, errors. Could you talk a little bit about accessibility on your campus? I know that's huge um, for so many schools. We're also gonna kick out a poll here, I think, while, while Melanie talks about that. Yeah, absolutely. Accessibility is huge. We could spend days just talking about that alone, <laughs> but um, it's one of the major reasons why we chose Funnelback Search. Um, at the time, we didn't have a tool that would allow us to produce comprehensive accessibility reports. We had a CMS and it allowed us to scan page by page on our site, but there was nothing that allowed us to aggregate all that together. And that's just not an efficient way to uh, run an accessibility project, especially when most of our sites have thousands of pages. And so um, we really love the accessibility auditor because it allows that aggregation of the data. It's all in one location. And um, it lets us get a, a big picture of the progress that we've made. And, and we were able in less than a year to decrease our accessibility errors by 93%, which was um, huge for us. Um, there were some, some really low hanging fruit that we weren't aware of that we were able to do site-wide that knocked out big chunks of errors. And um, so we were very pleased with that progress and, um, you know, the Im improvements that we were able to make, I will note, I feel like they impacted everyone, not just our visitors with disabilities. We often find that's the case though with accessibility improvements, things like headers for navigation on the page, um, button sizes for ease of use, color contrast, and alt text for images. Um, those are all common sense design things and practices that really benefit everybody, not just your people with disabilities. And, and I'll say that, you know, for our small web team, we have one full-time developer. We have a content editor who also shares non-web related duties. And then <clears throat> there's me. And so we were really surprised at how much we were able to accomplish with just our small team. That's great. I just saw the poll results go out. It was how big was your team? And most on this call have small teams. So that's that's really great. How big is your school itself, um, FTE? Or like, are you a small school or? or... Yes, yes, we are. So okay. um, our FTE is probably somewhere around 2000. We have mm -hmm. uh, about um, just under 3000 3, credit students annually that we serve, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I think having a small team, it's sometimes overwhelming to think of all the things you have to do, but it's good to know that Hey, small things can get things done too. Yeah. So data-driven decisions, this is thrown on so much in higher ed. How do, Everyone wants to make data-driven decisions, um, but so often in higher ed, I think we might have the data, but we don't use it. And, and often, and, and this is really from my experience, um, it, it's just hard to get to. Like you just, the right people don't have access to the data or it's just hard to get to. Um, you don't know what questions to ask. Um, so I guess question to you, do you use, some of the search query data to make business decisions at your campus, Melanie? Absolutely. Um, I mentioned just a minute ago, you know, about uh, the COVID crisis and how we use some of the search data at that time. But after we had implemented our search for a while, we were able to go back and see that our site visitors were routinely searching for um, dental hygiene and occupational therapy and some health science programs that we didn't offer on our campus. And so these unanswered keywords kept showing up in our list of, of search terms. And I shared this information with our academics administrators and so that they would know, you know, what, 
what are students searching for and what are maybe some opportunities for us to look into. But in the meantime, we were able to set up some best bets so that those keywords did return results for students and pointed them to health science programs that we do offer on our campus. Wow. And so they're getting access wow. to what we have available. And, you know, I'll say our academic administrators really appreciated having that data. Um, but also I'll note that in the time since then, um, when I looked back and compared from 2019 to today, we in increased our search clicks by 24%. And so I think the work we're doing, um, curating that content and making sure that, you know, what when people are searching for things, they're getting what it is that they're looking for is working. Wow, that is incredible. I love the fact that you're using unanswered keywords to drive program making decisions. That's that's amazing. Good example. Um, here's an interesting one I pulled out because this is one of the features of uh, any great search solution, especially funnel back, should allow you to con control your own search results. So when you're going through a web overhaul, um, you you should assume something's th things are going to break. Right. And we knew this. We were going to have URLs disappear overnight. So we thought early on, how are we going to handle this? It wasn't like it was off our radar. And we thought, you know, Google's going to re-index us. We'll put in the priority read indexing request. It might take us a few days. Um, it was a summer thing, so it won't be that big a deal. We'll put up this fancy 404 page that has a search built in with all the links, most of the links they'll need, and we'll be fine. And it, it wasn't that elegant. We were so overwhelmed with the project. This was our solution. And I just want to point out that you like, if if you you really need to take control of your search results, I think because so many schools, most schools, uh, you know, I say the lion's share are using a free product, you know, the big the big free product for search. Um, and so when you have just ten blue links, um, you, you and you're relying on a, a cache to be updated, um, you're going to have latency. And we realized that was one to two weeks of of broken links. And so what you can do if you own your own search results is um, control that index or also use something fancy like a, a REST API so that you control your search results immediately. So not will, only will that take you through a web project, but what about that content that since we're in such a decentralized nature in higher ed, we have so many people touching content, we're always going to be dealing with this. You just said it, Melanie, with inaccurate content, stale content. And so we need to kind of control that and I had probably maybe more than other industries um, to be able to pull things back right away. And so this is something that I think really is important um, is to be able to control search results um, in real time. Um, and I think you talked to me about possibly using this, you know, when you're going through your web overhaul, but. Um, Absolutely. I yeah, I, I mean, this is the stuff nightmares are made of, right? Like, it's what keeps us up at night. I mean, we're, we're just excited about having the flexibility to have more control over our search and over, you know, um, just like keeping the headache out of the project for our site visitors. Um, you know, we want to make that transition as easy as possible on them and reduce the headaches, not add to our work. <laughs> yes, thank you for saying that. Um, so this one um, is also huge and save almost the best for last year. Uh, and I can't emphasize this enough is when you have new navigation and you can have some real oversights or I would say perceived oversights, right? Even if you have an agency that specializes in and does a great UI and it's really tight, um, your audiences are going to see something new. And when they see something new and unfamiliar, uh, regardless of how much thought and research was put in, they're going to go. They're going to lean on search more. Now, now take into account. Often, you've probably already maybe not done as much research as you should have because of budget constraints or timeline or whatever. So that's even best case scenario. So through through a web redesign, that's probably one of the core tenets I would say is is since users are already students especially are relying on search, um, they're going to even more in a project like this. So um, although it can seem daunting to scope it into your project, you know we say do it before. But I think during is just as good because you're basically tagging it onto your project to say, make the project more successful, right? Because it's gonna, no one's gonna separate search from your web project. It's all kind of bulked together. So I would just recommend that if you can, you know, optimize your search before your project or during your project. But Melanie, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, 
are you thinking of things like making your your new and improved search more prominent in this new design or, or what are your considerations? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, we've all seen the research that shows that search is being used more and more and, and depended upon, especially by our younger generations who are used to tapping into search. Um, we're in the research phase right now of our redesign project. So we're literally putting out surveys and, and gathering focus groups this week is, is that's where we're at. And we're gathering that feedback to talk about how our visitors use our site. And so our goal, you know, through that and, and then the design part of it is to make search more prominent. And we're confident in the quality of those results and what it produces for our site visitors. And so again, you know, we depend on that to help them weed through the tremendous amount of content that we have as a higher ed institution. Good, good to hear. So it's, it often can be kind of difficult to quantify return on investment, your ROI. Um, and this doesn't really uh, tie right to a web overhaul project, right? It's just a real search in general, um, but but you can do it. It might be some, some work, but you can't quantify it. And one of the leaders in this is, is one of our um, our customers, BCIT, British Colum um, Columbia Institute of Technology. And what they did was they um, are the funnel back out of the box solution was put in. And number one, it was found to be 83% more accurate than their previous solution. And what they did, how do you track ROI in a university? Um, what they did was they tracked things like welcome packet requests, orientation signups, applications for admissions. Okay, these things that you can really, um, you can track uh, calls to action. And without changing the website, you can narrow it to search and say, okay, all we did is change our search. Look at what went up. And, and their user conversion rate for those things went up almost 14%. Um, their search was leaned on even more by 10%, and that's without the web overhaul or making the search more prominent. Um, so when you do that, you're building more confidence in your users, in your students to use your search rather than go to commercial Google. And so when you do that, maybe you're going to have more eyeballs for that communication that you need to get to them at some point. So um, you can do the ROI at BCI. No one does it as good as BCIT, I think. Um, but there are some other schools that have some, some data as well. Um, and I guess it converted to over $5 million increase in, in value for them. So that's, wow. I'd like to point that out. Yeah. That's impressive. So did you have any other closing things, Melanie? Because we kind of, I think we went through this. Um, I, I guess, you know, just uh, like to reiterate the value that it has brought for us. And, um, you know, we'd be happy to talk with anybody who's trying to make a decision about, you know, how they want to handle search on their current side, or if they're going through a redesign, you know, whatever that looks like for them. I think there's benefits for, um, you know, all of those situations. That's, that's, that's great. Um... One thing you know I didn't even plan to talk about came up to me now though too is you know you're in you're in the marketing side I've been in the marketing and IT side and what I wanted to say really kind of to close this is the marketers really need to have access to this data and it's really not been possible in the last or or really common in the last decade and now with tools like Funnelback and so many tools you know marketers are asking for that they're looking for access to this data and and. I would say the IT people don't necessarily want all the access. So don't be afraid to lean on your IT teams and say, hey, look, we have there's this tool out there. You know, do you think we could look at this? Because, you know, I've talked to IT teams that would love to, to delegate access to this. They don't want to always be tuning their search. That should, might be should be more of a marketing duty. Um, so I think marketing IT really need to work together, but it's really skewing more to marketing, even though they have less staff often. Um, you know, and just uh, something I wanted to point out. But this slide here is one how to get started with us. We're going to send you a link to our site search scorecard. Um, you can download our um, our guide to site search. We'd love to to, to demo search for uh, funnel back search for anyone on this call, um, and we'll send you a follow up email with this recording. But we do have plenty of time for questions. Um, but before I take those, I also want to tell everyone I'm going to be in Arkansas, really close to Melanie next week although she won't be at the conference, but Hyatt Web is next week. I know some of you on this call are at Hyatt Web, so stop by our booth, uh, stop by the Squiz booth at Hyatt Web and talk to us about search, about your digital experience. We'd love to talk to you. Um, so I'm going to close it with that. We're going to look at some questions, and that is about it. Okay, let's see here. Okay, here's a good question. 
we have a problem with our course is not coming up high enough in the search. We're using Acalog. Is that the problem? This is a great question. So the question is about this administrative content being combined with academic content, program information. So again, I go back when you're using a, a, another product, you, know, you often just see a bunch of links. Um, this is happening all over. We've done dealt with this so much, we have a separate template just to handle um, things like Acalog and Course Leaf, um, where we can connect directly to course catalogs and surface an, interfa an interface, a user interface that's based on um, the best practices in higher ed. So that's a great question. Um, it's not the problem that it's being in the course catalog. It's that we often direct our students, I think, to, um, to this course catalog over here, and they maybe won't find the button, or the course catalog interface is not easy to use. So why not give our users um, one search box to search across everything, right? Search across their social media, their, their course catalog, their directory, all that. All, that's, what, that's what we're striving to do, but that's a great question. Um, that is a good question, Jeff. We we actually use Acklog on our campus as well, and we have a, a faceted search. So we've got a, a search sort of landing page that has tabs for all of that content, and academics is one of those tabs. and And students or visitors can search just the academic content uh, information, or just right. social media, or you know, separate it out by by categories. Awesome. That's awesome. So we have another question here. Is there any cross in functionality between Squiz CMS, which is matrix, and our search engine funnel back tools? Are they integrated in any way? That's a great question too. So our core, the, the Squiz, um, I guess you'd say premium product is, is a DXP. So CMS is, is the, the kind of the, um, the previous iteration of content management and DXP is kind of the new one, I would say, because it's an open platform. So yes, Matrix, our CMS and search do work together for things like, you know, it might be news or events that you want to display in search results and your website. Um, but yes, all of our products, um, Matrix and Funnelback are the two front end products that can be sold separately, but then we can connect them together with our integration platform, um, um, which is what would, how we would do that with Matrix and um, and funnel back, but oh, I, we should do a webinar on our DXP. That's a great question. One more question here is how is how is funnel back licensed? Um, I'm not going to get into pricing on this call, but it's a great license model in that it's just um, based on your URLs. So as many sites as you want, how much content, how many PDFs and pages are is in your site index, basically, and there's levels. So it's a pretty simple. Um, um, SAS, SAS model. So that's a, that's a good question. Okay, any more questions? We, we, we have some time still. We have a few minutes. Okay, well, good <laughs> yeah, good questions. Um, I will close it now and we thank everybody for participating um, and have a great week.